Hi everyone, um, my name's Sam. Um, I'm with the Marine Resources team from Jersey with Francis, um, Alex and Paul that are also here. Um, I normally come along to talk to you about my PhD research, but that's what I've done now. Um, and I'm now involved in projects with the Marine Resources team. Um, and this is sort of following on a little bit, um, a bit more information about the black bream, um, which is one of the species that Alex talked about um, through the efficient cow project. Um, and this is a species that as a snorkeler or a diver, you may not actually see very often, they're quite good at hiding from people, but actually we have a lot of them in our waters. Um, this is a very brief overview of Jersey, a lot of you here will know about the Channel Islands and the big tides we have, um, and um, the depths of the waters. But um, it's just to, to make the point that our tidal currents um, are quite different. Um, there's, a, there's a front between Jersey and Guernsey, and then also between the wider channel, and that's what Alex was also talking about earlier, about the, the difference in temperature and that can have impacts on the timing of spawning of certain species in Jersey. Um, so it's just a, a short thing about that one. So the, the, Jersey, the Jersey bream, uh, well, there's been evidence about bream nesting on certain habitats, um, and we were trying to hone in on the areas that we would need to, to research to understand more about that process. And this is landings from uh, one or two particular boats in, this is just Jersey landings, so, some of the larger boats have BMS, so that BMS is a vessel monitoring system that we can use to understand where that boat's been um, on that day. Um, it pings about every hour, and we can get an idea of where that effort has been. Um, these two years are just because of one particular boat catching a lot of bream and landing it in. Usually the levels in Jersey are quite low, but we do have French vessels that also target bream in Jersey waters, and they are far more reliant on that species as part of their fishery. Um, so understanding where they go, where they're, um, where it's important for their, their nesting. So trying to understand the whole life cycle of the bream to, in order to improve the management. So if you're not uh, protecting them or managing them in that critical stage, um, it's like to have knock-on effects for the next generation. Um, and so using this data, we worked out areas where we thought the, the bream were probably nesting. So a lot of this um, effort is happening during the season when they are um, rowed up, so when, they, they've, um, when they're in their spawning season, which we can tell from the, the fish that have been landed, they've got the, the row inside their bodies, um, which is the eggs before they've been extruded. Um, um, so some of these areas aren't exactly in where, that, where the, the data is shown, so this is a bit further out, a bit harder for us to, to research. But historically, there was somewhere um, to the southeast called the Fricky, uh, the Fricky Box. And while there's not much fishing going on there now, it, we think it's historically a, a spawning ground for bream. So we've included that in our research. And Cornwall very kindly lended us a multi beam sonar um, to, to tow behind the boat. So this creates a very detailed image of the seabed up to a, you can pick out um, the relief of the seabed, so where there are pits or where there are rocks. And the, the way that bream nest, uh, well, the way that they've been researched and documented to, to nest in the UK is they sort of, um, it's about a metre wide area and they move all of the soft sediment from on top of a part of substrate below where there's just a sediment veneer um, and then on that stronger um, substrate underneath, that's where the females will come and lay their, their eggs. So the male does all of the maintaining of the nest females come in, lay their eggs, go, uh, excellent, this male's made a very nice nest, he's obviously going to provide uh, good genes for my uh, offspring, and they'll lay their eggs there. Um, but actually we don't have a lot of that type of habitat in Jersey, so we weren't 100% sure where, um, which sort of habitat we, was, we should have been looking for. Um, we have a lot more mixed sediments in areas, we have very strong currents, um, so there are some areas where we think they pick the algae off of rocks instead to provide that space and also further to the north um, they are excavating quite big pits instead and those are the sort of things that we were looking for using the multi-beam. So the multi-beam was a good, was the idea we could cover a large area very quickly um, to assess um, wide scale areas as we didn't have anywhere to pinpoint yet. And this is what it should look like when it works well. You can see all these little pits um, with the bream, sort of the, the depressions in the seabed. That's what all of those little bobbly bits are. Um, so that's what a very nice multi-beam image looks like. 
Um, unfortunately, ours didn't turn out quite as well. This is um, this is the track that we followed, um, and because our vessel can't quite get the slow enough speeds to keep it flying smoothly with the strong currents, it kind of um, you get a bit forward and it, it jerks it, so you get that sort of Constantina effect of the image, and you wouldn't be able to pick out a broom nest on there. Um, we did send it over to Cornwall for an expert to look at and see if they could make out something that maybe resembled broom nests, um, but no luck. So we went to plan B, well, plan B and plan C. So we have a multi beam sonar on our boat instead, which isn't as, um, it's not as detailed as the, um, as the one Cornwall lent us, but this one, you can pick out the relief features on the seabed. So you can see where that drop-off is and you can see where there's any particular, um, maybe ledges or um, trenches like this one, which is in this trench is the fricky box where it's um, area C. And these are areas that we think potentially where the, the current is being, where potentially relief from the current where they can build their nests and they're not gonna be destroyed with each tide. And so once we've highlighted, once we found these, areas where we thought it looks like there's um, a bit of a drop off there and we've got the, the trench in there. We went back with um, visual methods. So this is a tow video that was actually built to survey habitats around Jersey um, several years ago. And this is pulled behind the boat at very slow speed, as slow as we can. And there's a cable that goes to a screen on board so you can see in real time what's happening behind the boat. So you try and fly it about just about 10 centimetres above the seabeds to get a really clear image. Um, and then you can pull it out the way really quickly when you see a rock coming. There's no, there's no system to do that for you. And there's about a second delay as well between what's happening on the seabed and what you're seeing. So you've got to be quick. Um, and we took that to the sites that we'd identified using the, the sonar on the boat. And these are some images. Sorry, I thought that was a video. This is an image of a nest. So it's, it's quite dark in the areas. It's about 30 meters um, in the north, the northern area. Um, and that's a big pit that a broom has excavated out of the seabed. So the little fish is making this really big effort to remove the sediment on top. And the, the cobbles underneath are a lot more stable for the female to then go in and lay her eggs. Um, also, interestingly, there were loads of dead man's fingers in this site. Like, there were areas where it was just carpeted on the seabed, which I didn't know we had in Jersey before that. So that's um, potentially something else for us to consider for other management. Um, and then this was in the, the fricky box, the one to the south, where that big trench is. This looks like cleaned bits of rock. So um, there's a few areas. So it's, it's not as round or defined as the, the, the dugout pits, but this is something else that's been reported um, that bream do as they pick the algae up and then the eggs can be laying there. Um, it would probably require divers to go down and verify that there are actually eggs on those rocks for us to know that that's a, a bream spawning site. Um, and there was a survey plan to go back in 2023, so I didn't put them on the map, but we only managed to do two or three um, tow video surveys. We maybe covered about a mile or a mile and a half of seabed at each of these sites. Um, and it takes, it takes a while, that was probably half a day's work and you've got to get out there and go when the tides, the tides work. Um, so we can only really use the tow video on uh, slack water, otherwise you get a lot of, um, a lot of drag and it, it comes back to the surface. Um, so we had plans on trying to define that area a bit more and see whether it was all along that ridge feature, whether there was any more defined nests in, in the fricky box um, to help us um, with, with the management, if we can define or have a, a really good idea of where those nests are, we can start modelling it um, with the habitat type as well. And then that informs our management of when we should be closing the fishery to spawning. So should have mentioned those those boxes, they are closed to the trawl fishery during the spawning period to allow them to, um, those breeding to see out their nesting periods. Cause there's, there's a, some more research being done in the UK, but they're not sure when you take a bream from the nest, um, even through catch and release, if you put it back at the same time, will it go back to that nest or will it be spooked and will it be gone from there? Um, and that's something that they might be able to figure out through the, they've got a fish and tail array on the south coast of the UK where they're gonna trial, trial that and see whether the same bream go back to the same area once they've caught them and tagged them. 
Um, so we, we were going to go back this year. Um, if any of you remember, May was very um, windy. That's when the nesting period is. So we didn't manage to get out there at all. We had those northeasterlies for the whole month and we didn't get to, to go and do any more tape videos. So no future, no extra results to present. And then there's a little bit about just um, coming through. I forgot that was on here. That was part of <laughs> <laughs> um, that we're starting to see more octopus coming through because of the warming temperatures, we think warming sea temperatures. Um, and they are going to have impacts on other fisheries because they like to eat other fish and particularly shellfish. Um, I can't remember the link as to the bream. Was that just to um, highlight it? Yeah, um, well, uh, uh, we were going to do the 23 research, we are going to mm. try the 24, but octopus yeah. um, were just one of the many things that are changing, changing how the seabed may work and nesting fish holding on nests may be targeted and eggs may be targeted by big apex predators like these. That's it. Um, so another thing to, to look out for. Um, but yeah, understanding where where fish go and where the, their key habitats or areas for spawning or foraging or reproducing is really important in their management. So that's something that we're trying to hone in on more over the next few years through the various projects. Um, and that is me. I went a bit fast. <laughs>